crowd is here. I always start with this because I, boy, this is so loud. I feel so forceful. Yep, I'm uh, Tom McConnell. I've been uh, uh, I've uh, been a farmer for uh, a long, long time. Started uh, with the extension service in 1973, and uh, didn't know what I was getting into. And now uh, I don't know how to uh, get out of it. I'm still there. I'm, seriously consider making a career out of it. I don't know. If you guys have any other hints of things I might consider, let me know. But uh, I dearly love my uh, cows, my ewes. Uh, I just, uh, and I've worked my whole career to help people uh, stay on the farm and make enough money uh, to raise their families how they want to and, and where they want to. And uh, so uh, it was only natural for me to get involved in some of this risk management thing. So uh, as somebody once said, you better listen to what I've got to say because I've lost thousands of dollars learning this stuff. But uh, the first question, though, I want to, uh, I, I don't know where to go with this. I don't know how many, I mean, how much experience you have or anything there. So I'm just going to, as we used to say in the fifth grade, I'm going to stand up and say my piece. So I've got another presentation strictly on on LRP that we can race through this and do that. But I did want to, uh, there's some things that we need to uh, to look at. Because when you're driving by your neighbor and they're doing things that you think is uh, agricultural, if you will, this thing is bad enough, uh, that sort of like uh, risky behavior and all that, and say, I don't know how old uh, Billy Bob can, uh, can survive doing that. And maybe the answer is Billy Bob doesn't care how he does that because he's, uh, He's got different views on uh, on risk, how much risk he can take, and how much risk he should take. So we're not going to run through this too much, but I think it's important for you to, uh, at your leisure, go through this and evaluate just uh, your uh, your attitude toward risk. It all looks like uh, Methodist here. We're all sitting as far away from each other as we can which is important, but uh, anyway, at least we're at the gathering. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so take a look at this, and uh, we did this at our winter meetings several years ago, and the numbers that you come up with don't mean a thing. Who cares? The only person that matters to is you, because that will describe for you uh, your attitude toward risk today, and then maybe do that in a year and see what your attitude toward risk is is then. So there is a wide range of uh, uh, folks' attitudes towards risk. I think the big thing is, is uh, what are your goals? Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, what happens with your operation or to your operation, to your family when something goes wrong? And do you have a plan? Do you have a farm plan? Do you have a risk management plan? The, uh, the risk management agency has worked for years to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll back up. You look at uh, American agriculture, and we're always, uh, we see our friends to the west of us with corn and soybeans. I mean, neighbors too, but as a rule, that's where the concentration is in the corn belt. And you look at those folks, and, and it's, it's very obvious to see that uh, the USDA has, uh, since the 30s, in fact, worked toward uh, developing programs as the farm block, it used to be very powerful, which it doesn't amount to much in Congress anymore. The farm block wanted to keep their small farmers, small farm families on the farm. Well, if those guys were small farm families, we were barely a blip on the radar. But the bottom line is that those crops that grow in straight rows and easy to, to measure and all of that uh, are very easy for them to ensure. Well, we've kind of been uh, operating without a uh, net, so to speak, and so we've had to go back to our uh, 
operations and, and they use words like a more comprehensive approach to, uh, to risk management. Well, sure, that's what we've got. So what are your risks? Performance, price, predation, liability issues, weather, health. What of this can we control? What can we not control? And uh, what can we manage? Well, the whole thing, you know, as we said, a comprehensive deal, but when we talk about performance with pasture or if they're brood cows, we have to deal with what we feed cows and use in the winter time as well. We have to approach feed, feed costs, health, predation, quality, management. Sure, a time of rainfall and all of that changes some of this, changes a lot, but the bottom line is, when it comes to so much of this, it's on us. It's our job to manage these things. I learned this when I uh, became county agent, and uh, in Preston County, we grew a lot of corn up there in those days. And uh, so I got the Z text on corn production, where I learned that the Morrow plots, the Morrow corn plots at the University of Illinois, they grew corn 125 years straight. and. Uh, never put an ounce of fertilizer on there. Of course, you can probably get five pounds of soil, six, seven, eight feet deep. But anyway, the other thing I learned in that text was if every corn grower in the United States spent the U.S. average amount on his or, her, his or her corn crop and got the U.S. average yield, then all lose money. That's really interesting. And what does that tell us? It's about management. So I, I pull this up, I mean, it, it doesn't matter the year, it doesn't matter any of this thing. But what it matters is when we talk about all of these issues being on the farmer, we just see here that the old uh, Kansas Farm Management Association, they've done this for years, this is the first one I pulled up. Uh, more current prices would have been nice because now in the, in the afterglow, Feeder calves have brought a dollar or fifteen hundred dollars a head, or way more. Uh, we're all, you know, we're all uh, big time cattle people, and having a good time, and maybe we can get by with a little bit less management. But as a rule, there is a high group, high third, mid third, low third, and total uh, uh, net return to uh, management. Positive for the high group, negative for the mid group and the, the, uh, the low performing group. Well, the numbers change, it doesn't matter, but when you're making management decisions, we want to talk about, you can see this is pretty old. We'd all fall out of the chairs if we looked at money like that. But the bottom line is, there's no consistent thing, you know, uh, that, that separates one from another, but it does reflect the profitability deals with management, which is attention to detail, which is attention to uh, treating individuals uh, and not just as a herd. So the first thing I recommend everybody does, whether you're turning cattle out, buying a few uh, in the spring and feeding and turning out, or brood cows, whatever it is, but uh, I call it the West Virginia Quick View. Those of you that uh, uh, that this isn't about your specific record. All I'm asking you to solve for is the total cost per pound of calf, or if it's a uh, uh, backgrounding situation, the total cost per pound of, of gain. Now, you can do this uh, and compare it. We, uh, several years ago, we, uh, we did this with uh, lambs, and I, I, I interviewed uh, shepherds in western Pennsylvania, western Maryland, West Virginia, and Ohio. We had 47 sets of records, and, that, and then I helped them. We saw, for the, the, in that case, the total cost of uh, a pound of land. And the price varied from uh, a guy in Ohio on rented ground, no equipment, bought very little inputs, he was turning lands out for 20 something cents a pound. The extreme was another guy that was uh, turning out lands for $4.75 a pound. Okay, there's a difference there. And of course, in, uh, uh, 
I went downstairs where all the uh, really big brains are, and I said, what this means? He said, well, it's 19 cents as an outlier, and it's $4.50 as an outlier, and he said, yeah, we both have a right to buy them. But anyway, the bottom line was <laughs> that there was, there, there, there is a difference in that. Now, I think the, the thing that kind of bugged me about that was there was uh, 19, 20 cents, and then the next one up there was like 22 or 3 cents. Then the 450 guy, he was out, he was out all by himself. Then he dropped into, you know, and closer. But I learned an awful lot from that, and it's goals, it's how good your records are, how good your performance is, how good the sheep were. It goes on and on. But comparing that, if you're way out there, if you're that 450 guy, I think you want to say, John, well, you got sex, you need to check that. You know, I, 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 there's no way I can make this even today market make this work. But the bottom line is, since the goals and everything changed, I'm asking you to do a cost per pound up, whatever you want to measure. I threw these things out here, whatever you want to measure, and it's nothing more than just pulling it off your schedule F on your income tax. And by the way, it's probably a really good idea to keep some records and report all your income. Farmers are notorious, like 70% of all farm, farm income is uh, omitted, and uh, we want to get, we, we can go off on that forever, I mean, if you're going to pull that stuff, then, you know, then when the time comes and you're getting Social Security on on farm income, it's like, why we bother? Well, the reason we bothered is because we didn't report on it. But, if you want to do that, get it off your schedule, F. you can certainly find the invoice when you bought the cattle, and the invoice when you sold the cattle. You can keep some, some information down there. And then the only one to compare it to is yourself next year and see what you've done. We can talk price. Tom's a great cattle man. Uh, we used to turn out several cattle. And one year we bought a set of black, uh, black white face heifers. They cost 49 cents a pound. We wintered them, put 350 pounds on them, grassed them. Holy smokes, we sold the cattle for like 72 cents. That's more money than I agree with. So I'm sitting in there, oh man, we're fat and sassy. We go back to the same market and we buy the calf for that because the feeder is so heavy. We paid like 83 cents for the replacement head. Well, then the next year we went and did the whole thing, the funniest thing. They were back down to that 40 thing, you know? So we'll talk about what to do with that price later. But what I want to say is, I didn't learn a thing. I did not learn one damn thing with that experience. You know, I said, oh, I should have had better cattle, or gee, I should have hold, sold on a higher market. Well, that's hard to do when the market's the market. We don't have any control over that. So, but our goal as a manager is to figure out what it takes for us to uh, to make changes to become more efficient and and hopefully more profitable when the conditions are right. But we can't control our management level. Now, there are some marketing changes that you can make, but we can't c compare our marketing always and our success to our, our production. So I want to say that uh, that's on the WVU uh, Extension Service website and uh, I apologize for the purple. I have no idea how that happened like that. But anyway, uh, you get it home, open it up and change the purple to yellow or something. But all the color lines are the ones that you fill in. All the rest of it is theoretically protected and you can solve for that yourself. But just get your schedule F stuff. If you do nothing else, get uh, if you're just a single uh, commodity grower, take total of the Schedule F uh, gross, not the net, the Schedule F gross, and, uh, and then <coughs> the gross expenses, divide the pounds in there. That, that'll tell you if you're reporting accurately. Uh, I just was worried about a, a predation. Big deal. Uh, we're getting uh, more and more of that all the time. I just, uh, that same uh, website has a guard dog budget. The only thing I'm going to say about guard dogs is it's a little more involved than buying a dog and turning it out. And, you know, things change. And now, maybe I'm the only farmer like this, but I got a hunch there's a few other ones there. But the cheaper and the, the cattle are up against the side of the hill, the farther they get into the woods, the less expensive. And that's not a recommendation. I just want to be very soldier. So when you get into that and you've got guard dogs, those days are over. 
opposed to guard dogs when we get out of the paper and laying on the porch or run over or whatever it is. So, so there are expenses with guard dogs. And uh, I threw that in there because I think a lot of people, when they're considering something like this, they just grab an option and don't work through that. So I, I'd recommend you do that. Liability insurance. Uh, uh, I had a colleague went to school with him. He became a country lawyer. He was considered a country lawyer. And the state law reads you keep your cows, goats, sheep, whatever, and donkeys, of course, the, the bills and asses. And so these farmers are going to keep your ass at home. Well, here's the bottom line. You talk about liability. And I'll tell you, the fund's over. The fund's over if somebody, uh, if your cattle, sheep, whatever it is, are out, and somebody, uh, Hits one, and uh, it's a great way for hillbillies to uh, upgrade their transportation mode because they get one out and they get it. But uh, you know where I'm going with that. But so, what do we do about insurance? First of all, you have a written communication with your insurance team, your uh, whoever your agent is, and you say, "I want this to reflect," you know, and, and I mean an email or or a letter. Say, this, my operation currently is this, my marketing is this, my product is this, so forth and so on. They respond back to you, okay, you're covered, you know, say you, you buy $2 million worth of liability. If you have that in there, if something happens, you're covered. They can't, my favorite, a dear friend of mine in Preston County, Raymond Nyman, he, was, he paid his, he paid his taxes, or his insurance premiums, 40 years, and back when the round bales were out, and everyone uh, mistakenly said you could bale it wet and put it in the barn, and everything's okay. And that didn't work for Raymond. He burned the barn down, lost the hay and everything. The insurance company was great, and it just came right up, paid the premium, and dropped it. Okay? So we want to have a little better relationship with that. And the best way to do it is to spell out what we're doing. And any of us that are going to uh, the farmer's market or providing a market for processed uh, uh, animals, we want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that. They'll make it clear what they need. Don't assume anything. So, communicating with your agent is a must. Uh, and the other one, I learned from uh, days sitting on a hospital board, but uh, this really is important. We're not as bad about it as we used to be maybe 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you, if you walked across the farm, you'd sue something. And so that made us all afraid to uh, let people fish, to let people hunt, so forth and so on. But the bottom line is, sometimes if you get sued, it's real important that you take this, that case to the, uh, the court and you prove to them what you've been doing. So one is you've got a special right in your insurance policy. But more importantly, or as important, is you've done a farm safety inspection. Who should do it first? Have your agent out. If your agent doesn't care enough to come out and walk the farm with you and tell you what you ought to do, and communicate back with you, say, well, I found this and this and this, and you communicate back and I fixed this, that goes a long way because the jury and your peers, they're going to say, well, I think he's tried hard enough. Now, maybe there'll be some, you can certainly reduce your, your exposure. The last couple things here that I always harp on is because it, it I watch this, I watch Farmers do it for 20 some years as a county agent, nothing's changed, and if I don't watch myself, I get into the same thing. But I've got one farmer in my community who is as conservative and as risk free as anybody I know of. And one of the two reasons he is, is he feeds what his cows need per day, as opposed to rolling out. You know, I wouldn't talk about Ronnie, but someone has a job like Ronnie and me, you might be tempted to get a few days feed out there. Well, they're going to eat more feed or waste more feed. So I always like to uh, talk about feeding what they need for a day. And then uh, whatever, you know, keep the hay dry. And I just, uh, you can talk about types of hay and they keep really great outside and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you buy that special bale, that hay doesn't, doesn't break down, praise the Lord. But I got a hunch that there's a bunch of you that look at that outcome and you 
your own bail or isn't quite as tight and isn't quite as fancy, then you're going to lose a lot of hay. A lot of hay. So, store your hay uh, inside. Everyone says, ah, it doesn't fit so high. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. But I, uh, maybe you store what you think is extra because those dry years, when everyone else is scrambling around trying to, to buy hay, uh, yours will be in the barn. And hay does. Uh, I will get in. I want to. I want to move uh, on this. We just talked about the hay loss and what kind of feeders and that sort of thing. Cone feeders, how efficient they are. Rain feeders are great. You keep the bottom in. And it just goes on. But but uh, uh, I want you to watch your feed costs. Now let's talk about the type of risk that we can't control. And there we go. Price and weather. We can't control, we can certainly work findings through calf pools, and if you're not selling your calves in a pool, you need to take a serious look at that, because, Ronnie, how many dollars did the calf pool over a uh, regular uh, barn prices bring this year? Ninety to a hundred dollars a head. There you go. So you go, there's no pool in my area. Call Ronnie Hellman Dollar and say, We want a pool in our area. He'll show you how to get that done. I'd advise you to make it a co op because you protect a little bit more. But you can work that kind of thing. But when the price just falls out of bed, uh, you've got no, uh, if you don't do the following uh, option, I offer you, you've got no protection at all. And the other one's weather, and we'll talk about that in this one. So, uh, I'll give you a 30 second snippet on crop insurance. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Crop insurance is a very important uh, product for farmers. Crop insurance is underwritten by the United States Department of Agricultural Risk Management Agency. The premiums are, as a rule, uh, subsidized by the same USDA because federal government's going to get out of the out of the disaster. Now, listen to me. They're going to get out. And so, no matter how many of us stand in front of the local TV station and kick to us and talk about how damn dry it is and all that kind of stuff, there's not going to be any uh, cavalry coming in from Washington, D.C. carrying, you know, sacks of gold to get to us. Those days are coming to a screeching halt. We talk about the uh, farm block. It's gone. So we're going to have to move up there. Now, our government is trying to respond, but that comes in little bits and pieces. The, uh, uh, the last, one of the last things, crop insurance is not about turning a profit. If you raise vegetable crops, there are policies out there that, that allow you to insure profit. That's the only one. The rest of this is about not losing the farm or having enough money to fight another day. But, as a rule, Crop insurance in West Virginia in the last 10 years, for every dollar of premium farmers have paid, they've been identified $2.49. Who cares? That's not what this is about. This is about you're having, you're having uh, uh, protection. So, there's always this balance here, price and, and rank. The only option we have, these things that we really can't control, is we have to <coughs> spread that risk over a wider area. And so that means over a larger population, and we need to buy a policy. I then introduce you to LRP, Livestock Risk Protection. What is that for us? Livestock Risk Protection is a policy sold by the Risk Management Agency through precious few agents in West Virginia, but the, the agents we do have will travel and help you to get insured against an unanticipated drop in the cattle price. So, that, it doesn't have anything to do with your specific group of cattle. All LRP does is buy you a position in their expected, uh, basically, you've chosen a position in the expected end price as reported by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange feeder cattle price index. What hell is he talking about? What I'm talking about is that the uh, USDA, assisted by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, keep the uh, account
counted of all the feeder cattle sales in the 13 major cattle states. I mean, there's like 225,000 a day, something like that, 90,000 a day. You know, we kill about 130,000 cattle a day in, in the U.S. You can see what it takes to, to keep that going. Now, they go, what happens if we're buying a position in the market in 13 state areas, and trust me, West Virginia is not one of those 13 categories. What it means is we all see, except for that brief period of time that we all get grass fever in West Virginia, we pay so much money for those grass tests. As a rule, that, that market dictates what happens in the southeast. So if the price goes up, we can go along and we get there. Price goes down, we go and hurt. But what happens in those 13 states is what drives what we get into. So that's that's LRP. It's single parallel. It's I don't care, I do care. But regardless of whether you've lost half your cash crop or half your yearlings, this is a single parallel insurance program. Price. When this came to the state, I worked with. Uh, Bruce Babcock from Chad Hartwick from Iowa who were working with this, this program and we wrote across the state to ask farmers what they wanted. Well, we're a grass state, maybe not the biggest, but there's no state more dependent on the grass in the West Virginia. And it was like everyone rehearsed their their uh, their responses. Everybody wanted they wanted price insurance. You know, we all have short memories, and so we probably have a couple of growing seasons, and I, I was all over it too. Let's get price insurance. Now, the other thing about uh, crop insurance, if you end up in, uh, in Washington, D.C.'s meetings, and uh, the only reason we had it in West Virginia, Burlington did, is because I was on the program right behind a guy that wrote this program, and this is just how different this stuff is. So we got chat. I really like that up in West Virginia. So, okay, there it is. Okay, now I'm going to tell you another one here a little later on that hasn't gone quite that easy. But we got it in West Virginia now. It's all over the, it's all over the country. And uh, uh, one barrel price. Uh, current well says there's available in 37 states. Uh, how it works is you contact your agent. There's an agent finder on the. Uh, Website that probably I think there's even a, a live uh, uh, links are here. You find an agent, you sign a contract with that person, and then it's called a specific contract endorsement. You can insure one to a thousand cattle at a one fell swoop. You can, uh, uh, and the one up to a load is, is important for us. You can insure them uh, in increments, it says 30 days, from 13 to 52 weeks. So what I'm saying is you can buy a policy on your calves that are just born now for an October market or November. It's important to have the due date of the insurance, the same as your true marketing date. Or if you're buying cattle to turn out, you, uh, you buy a policy for those cattle in whatever marketing time you have. Oh, uh, it, uh, there. Here are the links of uh, how to find uh, more information on that. It's on the handout here. And, uh, but what I wanted to show you, what I want to show you is, it's called the uh, uh, expected end value of your cattle. Get online is one of the very first insurance policies that's done all electronic until you make a, a deal. And then if you do that, you've already worked all these, these pictures out with your insurance agent, and then you call that agent, and the agent keeps a phone with him or her, and when you're ready to pull the trigger because these, these uh, rates don't come out until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And so they change every day. They're loosely based on the feeder cattle contract, but they, uh, you have from 4 o'clock until like 8 or 9 just to make a deal. And if you miss it today, you do it tomorrow, it may or move in your favor, it may not. Then the agent does that, and then they give you specific instructions how to date the check, and if the check 
change the name last morning. This is when you pay your premiums up front. This is really a wonderful policy. It will not assure you a profit, none of that stuff, but it will prevent total disaster. Funny thing in West Virginia, uh, West Virginia is one of the targeted states, meaning we don't buy enough crop insurance to uh, sue them. But of course, the reason that is, is our agriculture doesn't match what uh, goes on the rest of the country. You know, we're small farms, uh, grass influenced and, and grass driven. So these, these new policies have come along for us. The, uh, uh, however, when, the, when these cattle prices got to the level that they are right now, our crop insurance agents are saying, we have more farmers buying crop insurance now than, than ever. Well, that's, that's reassuring. I mean, that, that's really good to know. And yes, that's one I, uh, I do use. Let me hand this, uh, this particular uh, handout out, and then I would like to, we're going to go back and forth here a little bit, but hey, can you try to help me hand those out and I can jabber more? Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about the other side of this, and then we're going to finish that real quick, and then we'll go back and I want to talk about uh, LRP. Because this next product is one that we ought to have, and we don't yet. And a bunch of us have been working very, very hard to get this requirement. What's the two things we can't control? Price and rain. I've got more. I'm surprised I'm a little underprepared, so uh, number wise. This is wonderful. So, West Virginia, and I've got a little cheat sheet here for you to have because I'm going to encourage you to contact your elected officials just to put a little zing into the, the thing. But if we've insured our price, and we're a very good capital state, and I was reprimanded by an agronomy specialist once uh, because I said the whole state is this and that the other thing. But there's a whole bunch of us that don't that uh, passion cattle on the side of these mountains. And for the most of us, we enjoy rainfall pretty much when we need it, and we're in a, a decent place to market. So let's assume we've bought in on the LRP, and now what happens when it comes to rain? This one is this is the pasture, rangeland, and forage. Of course, in the crop insurance business, we have to have that. I mean, it's required. TRF. And TRF based on rain only. It's a group policy, which is different than the LRP. You, an individual signs up for, for LRP, and then you report uh, uh, the price that the, the USDA Risk Management Agency determines that you're going to be identified with LRP. But this is called a group policy. It's based on a 10-mile grid of the, uh, of the state, and uh, based on rainfall, as reported by NOAA, National Oceanographic Aeronautic Agency. Okay, so you sign up, it's a two month interval. So think about this. Uh, you don't sign up for rain all year long. You sign up for when rain matters to you. If you're making first cutting hay, you probably want to have a little rain in, uh, in uh, March and April to grow a crop. If you're uh, pasturing cattle, maybe you want two months, uh, you know, later to go later in the fall. I mean, it's determined exactly on two month intervals what your operation needs. You sign up for this, and there's different levels based on uh, uh, how the rain did or did not fall, and what level of identification you you chose. I saw some rates for uh, hay crops, you know. Uh, Three or four hundred dollars an acre when it was dry. I saw as little as you know, fifty and sixty dollars an acre for a close to grazing. But these are all decisions that you want to make yourself. But of course, it's not in West Virginia yet. Every time I get a group of farmers to slow down long enough to talk to me, I talk about it. We have talked to everybody, and including we were blessed to have the uh, administrator of the uh, risk management agency in West Virginia a week or so ago. And we're hoping to get that going. Here's the thing that rubs me just a little bit. This is a map of the good old U.S. of A. And we start right up there. And the blue are the, the 
states that uh, have the product, and talk about some politics and being in the right place at the right time, maybe. New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, yes, Maryland, everybody right on down to the tip of Florida has it. You see the uh, uh, famous uh, grazing land there in the Corn Belt, and, uh, and here we are. West Virginia doesn't, doesn't have that yet. Now, I think that's going to change, and I hope that each of us uh, takes time to uh, uh, consider this product. I truly believe, since we have 23,000 farmers in the uh, in West Virginia, beef, or farmers, 60% of them claim beef, beef cattle, and we've got you know, 15 or 20 shepherds. That's not six or seven hundred shepherds. It seems like that. And uh, this, and the number of cattle that are, are grass, you know, backgrounds on these, these things, this is an important policy. When you've got your price covered and you've got your rainfall covered, I think this is a pretty, uh, pretty good time to have this product. Now, would you mind switching me over to the other one? I think we'll do it because I've got a temptation. No, I'm fine. I want to, I'll talk about this for a minute. And we pay $2 a piece of print. So enjoy. If you think you're going to put them in the log roller, give them back. I want them. I think you, I, I think I keep one on the dash of the, of the truck. A little income tax thing. Incidentally, you all understand that you deduct your uh, expenses to get in here and your registration off the conference. That's allowable expenses for your income tax. But, uh, you know, there's different ways to do accounting with your truck. If you've got a little jot and down book all the time, which this could serve as on that uh, dash of the truck, like we had a calf this morning, uh, she's a uh, little catcher. But uh, we'll get her on Saturday, but she's written down, so we know when that cow calf, you know, the sex of the calf and, and all of that. But if I put a quart of oil in that uh, three quarter ton GMC truck, which is only my youngest child, uh, maybe I should, you know, begin to keep an eye on that, keep actual records that way to get rid of, you know, to help you make decisions. We talked about, uh, we talked about this. Uh, LRP. I, I wanted to show you a couple things here. Yes, people do get identified. The guy that built this program, that's why I chose this old, <coughs> this thing's six years old, this, this presentation. But they, they started backcasting. Yeah, six years sure is. Anyway, uh, he backcasted. And that's just, you take, you know, what if you took the numbers of based on the Chicago Mercury Guild Exchange. Here's the baseline, the prices then, and believe me, they weren't as uh, radical as they uh, as they were as they are now and now it's more than that now up until then but that 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 uh, in 1996 identified six and a half cents well you know you get uh, 100 cattle and all of a sudden that uh, that becomes a serious uh, figure web based expected end values I want I got pictures of web based so you get on there as I said this is totally this is computer or internet driven. You can sit around and talk about this stuff. And this is one of those deals. Uh, I used to teach farm management and so I bought a couple of farm management textbooks. I thought it was good to turn around with that. The first one that goes, the manager's job, hot damn, I want to see what that is. <coughs> the manager's job is to uh, determine a farm plan and implement it. There you go. And the manager in this case we can talk about this forever. You either need it, I think most of you need it, or you don't. I was giving a presentation a couple years ago, and a guy said, uh, I said, you know, I think your bankers are going to soon uh, uh, you know, uh, demand that some of you folks have this. And the guy sat back here and said, I'm a banker, and we already do on some of them. But you get online, you do USDA, RMA, and there's, there's government websites on email. Quick, 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 the way they go. But you get up there and then you just, there's a query box, just go to Livestock Risk Protection, LRP. It'll bring you up to this page. This is Livestock Gross Margins. We don't need to worry about that. LRP Coverage Prices. That's the page you do. You choose uh, LRP. You see here's a, uh, I keep trying to find a little time to spend it. But you select an effective date. And 
So uh, West Virginia, then there's feeder cattle, there's, there's steers weight one, weight two are heavier steers, heifers weight one, and there is a difference in, uh, in how those uh, are uh, reported. But anyway, back to, to here, we go to that page, and it'll give us our end value, which comes up here in a minute. But they range from, this is old information, the 80 cents per 100 is probably pretty accurate. So you've got a set of uh, calves, and uh, you uh, choose a price or a percentage of that price, and so you might get as much as uh, 4 or $5 a calf in protecting uh, them at a certain price. However, if you choose a higher percentage of that price, it could be three or four dollars. Now we're seeing higher prices, greater volatility, and that could go up to seven or eight dollars a head. But here's the thing, here's the whole uh, philosophy behind livestock risk protection. It's how much protection you want. It's silly to spend the money to go up to 90% of that price. It just ain't there. I mean, it, it, it costs too much. But here's what you get. So we're on the page. The endorsement length, 13 weeks. You've chosen feeder cattle, steers, uh, one that's uh, up to 600 pounds. Now, the USDA Risk Management Agency calculates an expected end value. And that's based on what you see with uh, feeder cattle uh, futures and the whole Food. But these are predictive, they're not set in stone. So they're saying that on this particular contract, the expected end value is a dollar ten. Well, that was then. Now that's the common to see those two forty-five, two sixty-five. Coverage price is different than that. You see, you see the coverage price because you buy different coverage levels. All right. So here's the same 110, that's the expected end value, but I can choose 93% of that for $1.3, 91% of $1.1, 89 at 99. Then we come on over here, what does it cost? Well, the rate is, this is on a, this is, this is a USDA RMA thing. This, the rate is $2 per hundred, then you see immediately drops to a dollar and a half, dollar uh, eight, basically 10. 83 cents. So, what does that mean? I, I used to run them. I don't think I put any, uh, any scenarios in there. But the thing is, you buy protection for your calves at 85% of $2.45. The price, say it falls uh, uh, below uh, the expected end value of $2.45, and it doesn't kick in until uh, if it's 83 cents. To, or 83% till it's dropped below below that level, then you're indemnified by a dollar a dollar. And that's a real, that's a real uh, important uh, aspect. So that you know that no matter what happens in that market, maybe it's another mag cow, maybe it's a, who knows? We seem to invent things that go wrong uh, very hard. No place for speculators. Everyone says, well, if you keep talking about the uh, uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange feeder cattle uh, contracts, why don't you just do that? Three or four reasons. The first one is, there's, uh, they don't have contracts for 20 cattle. You have to, you have, to have your cattle pool. So the minute you insure more, the price of more cattle than you have, you're expecting it. Number two, been there and done that. You, uh, you buy a feeder cattle option, and here's the problem. There aren't enough of those traders. So you get online, you talk to your broker, and you go, I think I'm interested in that uh, uh, buying an uh, uh, option for $2.55 a pound on your calf. You say, okay, I'll get back to you. We'll jump in there. And they call you the next day and you go, bad news. I couldn't get anything done for that. We're in like uh, $2.80, and it's going to cost you such and such because you know, the price varies from that. Why is there variation there? They don't trade enough cattle. Back cattle? Hogs and all that stuff, there's plenty of volume. Feeder cattle, you can get lived pretty quick there. It's just not, it's not there. So, uh, uh, the further out these, uh, these contracts go, uh, the more variation 
There he is.
try to make more sense of this. You will have, uh, you will enjoy the uh, the opportunity to do this risk uh, awareness thing. It talks about things like. 